book of book of Jeremiah chapter number 17 and we're reading from the amplified version the sin of Judah is written down with an iron stylus with a diamond point it is engraved upon the table of their heart and on the horns of their altars as they remember their children so they remember in detail their pagan altars and their asherim beside green trees on the high hills O Jerusalem, my mountain is my mountain in the countryside. I will give to the Babylonians as the cost of your sin, your wealth, and all your treasures as plunder. And throughout your territory, your high places of sin. And you will, through your own fault, let go of your grip on your inheritance that I gave you. And I will make you serve your enemies in a land which you do not know. For you have kindled a fire in my anger, which will burn forever. This is pretty explicit, very strong words. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in and relies on mankind, making weak, faulty human flesh his strength, and whose mind and heart turn away from the Lord. Verse 6, here's a key. Here's our picture. Are you ready? For he will be like a shrub. Everyone say, a shrub in the parched desert and shall not see prosperity when it comes but shall live in the rocky places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land verse 7 here's our contrast blessed with spiritual security is the man who believes and trusts in and relies on the Lord and whose hope and confident expectation is the Lord for he will be nourished like a tree planted by the waters that spreads out its roots by the river and will not fear the heat when it comes. But its leaves will be green and moist and it will not be anxious. Everyone say, no worries. It will not be anxious and concerned in a year of drought, nor stop bearing fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things and it's extremely sick. Who can understand it fully and know its secret motives? I, the Lord, search and examine the mind. I test the heart to give to each man according to his ways and according to the results of his deeds. Like the partridge that, hatch, that hatches eggs which he had not laid, so is he who makes a fortune in ways that are unjust. It will be lost to him before his days are over. and In the end, he will be nothing but a fool. And I'll just stop here at this last verse, verse 12. A glorious throne set on high from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary, the temple. Wow. A glorious throne set on high from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. I'm going to talk to you about the tale of two trees. Let's lift our hands, let's lift our voices, and let's pray just for a minute. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We pray that your living word will preach the written word tonight. We ask you, God, that you would help us to speak and hear, oh God, with revelation and with understanding. We bind every resisting spirit, whether human or demonic, and we ask you, Lord, in the name of Jesus, help us to be healthy, help us to be vivacious and fruit-bearing. Set us, oh God, in the place, oh God, where we will never worry. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord, for your word. Everyone say, in Jesus' name. Turn to two or three people and say, I bless you in the name of the Lord. And then you may be seated. Trees are all over the Bible. You read about them in various places. And starting from the very beginning, all the way through the most famous tree, it's in the Bible, which we know as Calvary. You see, in the garden, there were two trees. There was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and there was the tree of life. And you would pass that tree of knowledge of good and evil every day, if you so chose. If you were going to partake of the tree of life, which God did not tell them was prohibited. He, he didn't say you can't eat of that tree. He just told them what it was. The only tree he told them that they couldn't have was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 
And so it was something that was a daily choice that they had of whether they were going to serve God and walk in His ways and accept the environment that He had set for them, or whether they were going to try to seek out wisdom their own way and to try to be wise on their own accord or trust in themselves. So in here, Jeremiah 17, he is talking about the state of man. He is talking about the condition of man. And he's especially focusing in on Judah here. And he is talking about how sin is the bottom line. It's, it's what's underneath everything else. You can talk about all kinds of other issues that are on the surface, but he is saying there is a, there is a, deep, there is a deep problem here in man's heart. There's something about his own heart that is deceitful. There's something about his own heart that is sick. There's something about his own heart that, that uh, is, is constantly turning towards uh, sinful things. And so it's not really a popular thing to say. It's not something that we want to hear. Uh, but we cannot solve a problem that we are not willing to face. We cannot overcome something that we are not willing to acknowledge is there. We cannot be successful in our own life until we take our proverbial head out of the sand and say, you know what? Uh, let's find out what's really going on in this situation. And so he starts off by, by just describing that, that this is etched in iron. Th this is not something that, that, that Judah has done that was a one-time thing. He said, this is etched in iron. This is a stylus written upon a rock. This is their sin. And oftentimes, uh, oftentimes, even in our own way of dealing with things, he said our hearts will try to play it off as it's not really a big deal or it's temporary or it was just a, a little lapse or something. But he's saying, no, 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 this is, in a, this is a pen that, that is etched, etching these words of what they have done in iron. Wow, what a vivid reality. And, and when we are faced with, with our own selves, when we see ourselves, it, it, it's difficult for us to, to hear it. It's difficult for us to, to, to acknowledge it. But then when we are finally facing that reality, we, we come down to this, here it is. This is the truth. And at that moment, we have a decision to make. And that is, what are we going to do about it? What are we going to do about it? The human condition is described here now as two entirely different environments. It's two different trees. And he says that he says that they are like they are like a, a a man he said he's cursed let's go back to this in verse 5 curses the man who trusts in or relies on mankind making wheat weak faulty human flesh his strength whose mind and heart turn away from the lord he will be like a shrub this is a this is a juniper tree, a stunted juniper tree. And the word here in the Greek actually means to be naked. That's what it actually means. It is a tree that because of the type of tree that it is and the environment that it's describing here is a tree that, that looks almost, uh, almost like it doesn't have any life in it at all. It looks uncovered. It doesn't have a, a lot of growth on it. And so when you would look at that tree, you would say that shrub looks like it's exposed or it's naked. And he says, this is what it's like. This is a curse that comes upon mankind when he trusts in the arm of flesh or we trust in what humanity can do and what humans can do and what we can do on our own. If we just are trusting ourselves, he said, this is what happens. We become exposed. We become naked. We are like a shrub in a parched desert and we will not see when prosperity comes, but we'll live in the rocky places of the wilderness we have seen it so many times where you'll look at a life and you'll say man it just seems like everywhere you look that there is just it's just dry it's just parched it, it's, it's naked it's uncovered it's a wilderness and it's like their whole life is that way their, their their whole world is that way and it's simply because they are leaning upon the arm of flesh they're limiting everything that they can do and everything that they can be to what is in the human dimension 
But can I tell you something? That's not how we were made. That's not how we were designed. That's not how it was from the beginning. Jeremiah, after he talks about the human condition of the heart and describes what it looks like in a very picturesque, picturesque way, he's saying you're like a shrub in a, in a salt land that doesn't have any good nutrients in it. He said, but let me tell you, when you trust in, when you rely in, when you put your hope in the Lord, he said something else changes. God literally transforms you. You're no longer like a shrub, but you're like a beautiful bay tree that's planted by the rivers of water. Not only does he change the nature of the tree, but he changes the environment that they live in. These are not just two trees that are, that are, that are uh, not too far away from each other. He is saying, no, there's one that's in a wilderness and there's another one over here that's by a fertile riverside where all of the nutrients are constantly feeding that tree and he said it's filled with foliage it's filled with leaves it's filled with fruit and he said even when the drought comes it's not going to affect this tree because he's got his roots by the river thank you Jesus when I put my trust in you when I put my hope in you when I rely upon you everything changes touch somebody and say everything changes now, now, now touch somebody else and say I'm a transplant <laughs> I used to be a shrub in a wilderness in a dried up place in a rocky field But he's saying, God completely transplanted me. He changed my nature completely, entirely. I'm not even the same tree that I was before. He said, you were a shrub, you are a shrub, but this is what he says, but when you trust in the Lord, you'll be a tree that's by the river. It's an entirely different lifestyle. It's an entirely different rhythm. It's an entirely different mentality. It's an entirely different flow. It's an entirely different environment. Everything changes. You heard that song, everything changes. Everything changes. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. The earth is shaking. So he said, everything changes. Touch somebody say, everything changes. Everything changes. When you are trusting in the flesh, <laughs> there's no future there. No matter how determined that bush is, he's a bush. He's a dwarf juniper tree. And you know what? Every time anybody looks at him, they're always going to say the same thing. Man, that looks, tree looks really bad. It looks naked. It looks exposed. I used to, when we were in the, in, in the uh, summertime, you see the beautiful foliage on the trees. And when I lived, used to live where there were actually four seasons. <laughs> We would have heavy snows in the wintertime. And I would always see the, the branches that were so stripped with leaves. And I would think, God sent the snow to clothe the nakedness of the branches and to cover them so that they would feel more comfortable in their winter. But there was a constant understanding and hope that when the spring comes, those roots have gone down deeper and that soil has been enriched by that winter. All of those leaves that have fallen and be, have become absorbed into the ground and the deep nutrients, that big thick snow, three or four feet, has built a beautiful, uh, a beautiful restor restorative process of that soil and those trees. Man, they just break forth in the, summer, in the, in the springtime and the summer again. And you see that. 
that tree being exposed in that wilderness place. The environment in the wilderness is a wilderness. That means there's nothing feeding it. There's nothing changing it. It's going to always be a wilderness. A wilderness is, is always a wilderness. It is that way because it doesn't meet uh, the requirements. It, it, it's in a place that is in the earth that, that does not get the necessary ingredients for it to have any more life than those things that can barely survive there. And what God is saying to us is that, is that this is life without direct dependence upon Him. This is life that, that does not have trust in Him, that, that has confidence in itself. He said, this is the real picture of what it is. There's all kinds of facades, but let, let me tell you, this is the environment, and this is what it looks like, and it's never going to change. The default is always going to go back to a wilderness. Now, he said, this tree that's by the river, what is it? This tree by the river. He said, there will be a time when there'll be a drought, but because it's planted in the right place, because its roots are in the right place, and because it's by the river, it has absolutely no worries. Touch somebody and say, no worries, mate. When we were in Australia, we learned, we learned to say that. No worries. No worries, mate. No worries, mate. It's all right. It'll be all right. It'll be okay. And they say another word, fat income. That's another one of their words. It's like, it's, that's okay. It's straight up. It's no, no problem. So we'd say no worries. And I picked that up on the way home, man. I was just saying it all the time. They would be like, oh, I spilled your drink. And I'm like, the, no worries, you know. I'm sorry, it took me a little bit to bring this out. Uh, what, what you asked for? No worries. Everything that happens, you just start walking around, no worries. It was an attitude. It was a mentality. It was an idea that maybe you're stressing out just a little bit too much about things that aren't really that important. Remember, I was carrying a lot of stress one day, and I went in to get my, to get my hair cut, and the sweet lady that cut my hair, we ended up winning her to the Lord. And so when I would go in there now, you know, this was... Uh, this was time for her to try to help me and try to give back to me a little bit. So I was sitting in the chair, and she goes, oh, Pastor, you stressed. <laughs> I got a song for you. And she goes, and she, she goes over, she goes over, I'm going to play a song. I'm like, oh, my goodness, what is she doing now? And she goes, no worries, be happy. No worries, be happy, no worries. <laughs> she goes, there, now, now, <laughs> you too stressed. You need to stop worrying. They played the whole song when she cut my hair. And I, <laughs> I'm like, okay, okay, yes, Lord, I hear you, Lord. If I'm by the river, if I have the supply of the Spirit, if I'm not worried about flesh and I'm not worried about people and I'm not trusting, my confidence is not in people, then you know what? Then I'm going to be okay. There might be some seasons where it doesn't rain, but even in those seasons when other people might get upset, I, I, I shouldn't be upset. I shouldn't be worried. I shouldn't be stressed. Why? Because my trust is in the Lord and He put me in an entirely different environment. I am in the environment of His love. I am in the security of His care. I am now subject to His faithfulness. It is now His word that defines my life. And because of that, I am secure that though I may fail and people may fail and somebody else may disappoint me, He will never fail me. He will never let me down. And He changed my nature that I'm not the same that I used to be. I'm not uncovered. I'm not naked and exposed. I'm not out in a wilderness where I have no future. But you know what? Now, I'm in a place where he said, you're always going to bear fruit. 
I want you to accept this as a reality. We are in a season of change. Every two years, there's some kind of an election that goes on in America. Every four years is presidential, and we have all these debates, and there's all this shifting, and who's going to be the, the nominee, and who's going to do, and, and we have again this question mark over us in our nation of what are we going to be, and what is our future, but I want to tell you something. It doesn't matter if Trump gets reelected or doesn't get reelected. I am secure in who I I am and we're gonna keep on bearing fruit we're gonna keep on being the people of God because we're planted by a river touch somebody and say I've got a river you see that river is what determines the outcome of my life if I am a tree and I have a river it doesn't matter whether it rains or doesn't rain I have a supply that never runs dry and if you have a river in your life, there may be times when everything looks good and the economy is great. And there's times when it doesn't look like it's going to be strong and we go through a depression. But you know what? Uh, in, in weakness or in strength, I have his grace. I know that he is with me. I know that he is my support. And so I don't worry. The longer that we live, the more pressure that we'll face in our lives. The more opportunities we will have to be discouraged, to be disappointed. The more knowledge that we have, Solomon said, with more knowledge is more sorrow. That's why they say ignorant is bliss. You know that I see kids playing and I say, they have no idea what's going on in the world. We used to feel bad at some people that uh, might be a little slow. And I thought, you know what? It might actually be a blessing. You know, look at how happy they are, you know. I don't know anything. <laughs> and so you, 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 uh, you get a little bit older. You, you have more, more things to know about, more, more, more problems, more potential. And when you're a kid, man, you just run through gardens. And at least we used to drink out of hoses and... We played in the alleys and jumped over fences and dogs chased us and we jumped back over the fence and got the ball or jumped back over the fence and kept on playing. You know, mom just called us in the evening. Now it's like we are so filled with so many problems and so many situations and man, are you kidding? We have to know where our kids are every second of every day and we have to monitor everything and monitor everyone and don't drink out of that. It could have something contaminated in the water, I mean. Everything you, every, everywhere you look, because everyone's doing exams. I mean, do you know what's in a McDonald's French fry? You know, oh my God, I don't know. They taste good. You know. As soon as you read about it, you're like, oh my God, I didn't know there was beef broth and French fries. You know. Just leave it out for about a week. Nothing will change. You could warm it up; it'll taste the same. Something's wrong with that. Preservatives in there. So you start, you start everything you eat, something could be wrong with it now. I mean, you can live your life and you can be a hypochondriac because we have so much information that's coming at us. And then there's so many real issues that are in the world that are constantly challenging us of the what ifs. But you know what he said? If you know that you've had a change and you're not trusting man, you're not leaning upon man, my trust is not in government. I'm not saying that I am being disrespectful to government, but that's not where my trust is uh, 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 my trust is not in other human beings I'm respectful and I'm thankful and I work with a lot of really great ones here at the church triumphant but you know what my trust is ultimately in the Lord and so that's where my hope is and so that's what I know is my guarantee in my life and something happens to you a security comes into your spirit when you say this is where I'm planted this is where God put me and he told me a drought's coming but I don't need to be afraid he told me there might be a season where it gets really hot he said but even in the heat he said I want you to know I've prepared you and I put you in a place where it's an entirely different environment do you realize that the church is its own environment do you understand the kingdom of God is its own environment and in this environment where we trust the Lord he makes the rule 
He determines the outcome. And he gets the maximum potential out of us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Trust. Trust is the core issue here. Trust. Are you trusting your own heart? Or are you trusting in the Lord? Are you trusting your emotion? Are you trusting your feeling? Or is your trust in the Lord? Are you leaning upon yourself? Trusting your own instincts? I did it my way. And now the end is near. And then what does he say? Okay, I know. <laughs> you didn't know I could do Sinatra. Okay. He's like, I, I, I regret, regrets. I've had a few, but then, well, too few to mention. Because <laughs> I did it my way. This is, this is it, folks. This is the world. This is how the world lives. This is their operational uh, concept. This is their, their center, their navigating principle, is, is doing it my way. I, I want to do it my way. We all want to do it our way. But what he says is, this is where the curse comes from. This is what makes us uncovered. This is what puts us in a guaranteed wilderness. This is what dries us out. This is what keeps us from being fruitful. But if I say, wait a minute, does God have a divine design for my life? Did God plan for me to be different than what I am? Imagine the contrast of that first man, Adam, for 950 years, he had to walk up to the boundaries of Eden. And they would maybe peer in. The Bible says that there was an angel of fire that guarded it. The Hebrew word, <clears throat> the Sumerian term is even stronger, but the original, uh, the original language there says a whirling devastation. The sword of fire was not just an angel standing there was on fire. It was a whirling devastation. A whirling that if you were to try to touch it, it would just completely destroy you. And to say, right over there is the place where we started. Right over there, there there's four rivers that came out, and there was gold in those rivers, and every kind of fruit, and every kind of, uh, and, and the unity, and the harmony, and, and over here, it's the sweat of our brow. Over here is thorns and thistles. Over here, it, it's destruction and death and dying and people that are fighting with one another. And, and, and he barely has five minutes outside, uh, it seems, outside of the, of the Garden of Eden. And, and Cain and Abel are already having problems. And you say, God, you had something better in mind for me. I just didn't understand how good I had it. And so God sometimes allows us to have a contrast in our lives enough. He lets us see it. He lets us face that, that iron pen and that stone and where it's engraved there. We see the, the, the finality of it. The, we see the, 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 the permanency of it, of our nature, until we say, okay, God, I realize no matter how hard I try, this environment is not changing, and my nature is going to remain the same. I need some help. I can't get out of this mess without you. I can't get to where you want me to be without you. But now we see hope written in the scriptures. Blessed is the man that puts his trust in the Lord. That you can move from a curse to a blessing by shifting your trust. And this is what God is saying. I want you to get to the end of yourself. Everyone say the end of myself. This is the secret, folks. Every wilderness experience is designed to get us to the end of ourselves. It's designed to get me to the end of myself. I go through a, I go through a test. The test is to get me to understand that my nature is a certain way. My flesh is a certain way. And my heart is deceitful. And he knows my heart. And he's going to test my heart. And he's going to help me to come to truth. He's going to help me come to realization. And in that moment, I say, okay, God, I need to be transformed. And then I need to be transplanted. 
I need you to put me in an entirely different environment. And so the Bible says he's translated us from darkness and he's taken us to light. He's moved us into his kingdom. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things have become new. Let's clap our hands and thank the Lord for that tonight. Hallelujah. So here it is. Let's, let, let's break this final, this final segment down. Let's talk about the river. What does that do when you live by a river? It means that the river carries things to you. And it means that it's always flowing. But it also means that beneath the surface, even where the river, where beneath the river bed, which would be visible, somewhere deep beneath maybe even hundreds of feet down, there is still rich, fertile soil. That's what it means. So in the hot season, when the river is not as strong, when it may be down to a trickle, I discovered this when I was in Israel. Uh, they took us uh, up into the mountain range and they showed us the Valley of Elah. The Valley of Elah is where David fought Goliath. And the Bible says he went down to the brook and he pulled out five smooth stones. And I'm like, I want to see that river. Where is that river? And he looks at me and the tour guide goes, oh, the river only flows certain months of the year. It is dry now. There is no river. You can see the rock, but there is no river. And I'm like, oh, so it doesn't always flow. It's not always there. No, but when David was there, there was a brook there. And he took the stones out of that brook. And I think, wow, there are certain seasons when even the river will run dry for a while. The river's down. And so that soil beneath that riverbed is still so rich that those roots are tapping in to a hidden supply of nutrients and water. So on the surface it looks a certain way but that tree you would never know it this is exactly what jeremiah is trying to say to us is he is saying that he doesn't worry he doesn't worry because he knows he's by the river and if there's not much water there in the heat of summer he knows the water is coming back it's not going to take long but in the meantime i have such a deep root structure in such a fertile soil he said that i'm going to always bear fruit i'm never going to have a season without bearing fruit and what i'm telling everyone in this room tonight and i'm reminding myself tonight is that god has rooted us in a great place we has put our roots down in a fertile soil and we have to see the big picture of what he's doing in our life if you see it in the immediate sometimes man it's a hot day or you see it in the immediate wow i'm going through a season where the river might be waning a little bit there will be a time when on the surface it looks like it's not very good but can i tell you something if you're rooted and you're grounded and planted in the kingdom of god you don't have any worry because you know that you're by the river and that whatever you need he's always gonna supply no matter what season that you are in those roots are gonna be able to tap the nutrients i've got something far beyond a surface experience i've got some deep roots in the kingdom of god and i'm telling you if we got a church with strong roots we can handle anything this is why we go through discipleship this is why we make good friends this is why we have accountability this is why we learn how to pray this is why we read our Bibles this is why we spend time in the presence of God this is why we come to church this is why we're here on a Wednesday is because we are making sure those roots are going deep into the ground and we're getting secure and strong and that wind comes and blows but we say no 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 I'm not worried I'll just worship my way 
lay right through the wind. Why? Because my roots are so deep and I know that he put me by the river. The river's going to take care of it. It's all going to flow. It's all going to be all right. And when I know that I've got the Holy Ghost, folks, even when I'm tested, I know there's a flow of the Spirit because my trust is not in myself. My trust is in the one that planted me. My trust is in the environment that he put me in. My trust is that he's going to supply. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I tell people when they're in ministry that there's always going to be two sources and not one. Oftentimes, people just tap into one source. They just want to get in the river, and they just want to give people things that uh, God has given them. In other words, they, they study or they research or they do their ministry, and, and all of the maintenance uh, for their ministry is the totality of their relationship with God. In other words, if they're not serving, then they're not preparing anything. If they're not doing a ministry of some kind, then they're not really in the Word of God. But when they have to do something, well, then they're going to go, Oh, God, please. Oh, I have to do Sunday school this week. God, I just, they're going to ask me to do that visible illustration. Oh, I need your help, God, please. Oh, Lord, I'm not very good at this. God. And we're asking God, or I'm going to sing this week. Oh, Lord, please, I need your help. I'm going to teach you Bible study. Oh, God, I need your help. I've never done this before. Oh, God, I feel like I'm supposed to talk to my coworker over there. Jesus, please, not any right now. I need a word. I need something you can help me. My, my, there's a brother over there I need to encourage. Oh, God, please give me a scripture. Give me a word. And so we're always trying to tap that river that's flowing in the spirit for ministry purposes. But there has to be a second layer to that, that you are not just fed by the river that's on the, on the surface that your, your, your life is not just existing in what is visible and what is accessible to everyone. When we come together and we're assembled together, whether it's, in, uh, whether it's in one of your ministry groups or whether it's on a Wednesday or a Sunday, when you are together with other believers and you're worshiping and you're praying, that's a river that's accessible to everyone and we all enjoy that. And we, we get the full advantage of that river. But guess what? There has to be a second part to that relationship with God. And that is that you're nourishing your roots. And that's where nobody's watching and nobody can see. I have to come and read the Word of God, not just because I'm going to speak on a Wednesday or I'm going to speak on Sunday, but I've got to open up that Word of God and I've got to read that Word of God to nourish my own relationship with Him, to nourish that trust that I have in Him. And I read things and I study things. And you know what? I may never ever preach it or I may never ever, uh, ever have it as that is the purpose, but there'll be a point when I'll read into that root structure and I'll pull it up when I really need it when I'm in a situation I'll remember you know what I studied that a long time ago and now I can apply that to my situation because it's about my relationship with God and it's in the overflow of my relationship with God that I'm able to minister to other people and that's why I'll never burn out and I'll always bear fruit Christians that lose their way and walk away are people that are just operating on surface experience and never really get the root structure. But when your root structure is right, when your relationship is right, when you've nourished those roots, you can handle anything. Because guess what? When that tree gets in the ground, well, we were on the, we were out the park at, for the 40s to 60s TNT pink, uh, picnic the other day. We went down to feed the, the ducks. We thought we were feeding ducks anyway. It ended up being seagulls. <laughs> but they were acrobatic seagulls, I can tell you that. Never seen anything like it. I could throw it in the air and they would dive and catch. Yeah. Anyway, the fish are already gone. Apparently the turtles got them all, but anyway. But I noticed a tree, and it looked like a hurricane had probably ripped it half out of the ground, 
because it was at a 45 degree angle. But I turned and looked at the kids and I said, but that root structure of that tree was so strong that even in the hurricane, when it blew it half over, that tree is still growing. It just, set, it just kept growing at that angle and the, and the branches just kept, now they're just going to grow straight up from where I got bent because that storm did not take that tree out. It just kept growing in spite of what it had been through. And so I'm going to tell you something. When your root structure is strong, there, even when you get bent, <laughs> even when you get pushed, even when things seem to, to, to be so disruptive, the roots are so determined in the soil. They say that whatever size of the branches are on the outside, that's how big the root structure is below. So if that tree has a, has, has a spread of 20 or 30 feet below the ground, it's at least 20 or 30 feet of, of roots that are beneath because that's what it takes to uphold the weight of those branches and the weight of that tree because it's preparing to have some fruit can I tell you we are getting ready to bear some fruit we are getting ready to have a harvest we are getting ready to go into a new dimension of of, of God's prosperity being brought into our life and what's been happening is God has been preparing us by putting us by the river by transforming our hearts by changing our nature and by nourishing our root structure so we can handle the growth. Would you stand with me right now? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I want you just to lift your hands to the Lord right now, and I want you to give him praise tonight. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Lift your hands. Word. Tell him, I trust you, Lord. I trust you, Lord. Jeremiah said, I'm going to take you back before your heart was ever deceitful, before your sin was ever written in stone. And let me take you back to sanctuary. He said, in the beginning, there was a glorious throne. That was the starting point. A glorious throne. So we come into this place. Something happens to us. I was thinking about it tonight. Seeing people jumping and dancing on a Wednesday. We used to sort of characterize services. Just kind of say, you know, Wednesday was supposed to be laid back. And you just sort of, kind of just raised an arm. You know, you just kind of. It's the middle of the week, you know, don't expect much. Just be happy that I'm here. But I was thinking, you know, our church is just all in all the time. We just come and we just worship every time we're here. And it doesn't matter if it's a Sunday or if it's a Wednesday. We're just worshiping and rejoicing. Because you know what? It, it all starts with a glorious throne. It all starts with knowing that He's there right in the center of our lives. And so we come to worship him you go down just a little further and this is what he says in verse 14 when I'm in that presence heal me oh Lord and I will be healed save me and I will be saved for you are my praise Jeremiah says your heart's sick 
It's deceitful. You can't even know your own motives. He said, but he knows your heart. He knows where you are. And now, let's go back to the throne. And let's go stand in his presence. And now this is how we pray. My heart is sick. Heal me, oh Lord. And I'll be healed. Save me. And I'll be saved. These altars are open. I wonder if we would just come and stand just for a few minutes tonight. Just stand in His presence. The reality is There was an ugly tree that Jesus hung on and he hung on it for you and he hung it on it for me so that we could be healed and so we could be saved and so we stand in his presence and we thank him for Calvary tonight would you thank him that he hung on that tree Jesus I thank you that you took my place you took the ugliness you took the nakedness you took the stone that was written with our sins. You took our deceitfulness, oh God. You took it all on that tree. You became sin for us. Now I stand in your presence. And I lift my hands in your presence, Lord. And I say, heal me, Lord. <laughs> and I will be healed. Save me, O Lord, and I will be saved. You're my praise, Lord. You're my praise, Lord. roots go down. Help my roots go down deep, Lord. Let my roots go down deep, Jesus. Let my roots go down deep, Jesus. Oh, God. I want to be rooted in you. I want to be grounded in you. I want to be planted in you, Jesus. You are my refuge, and you are my hope in the day of disaster. <sighs> my trust is in you. My hope is in you. Heal me, Lord. Heal me, Lord. Heal me, Lord. I'll be healed. Save me, Lord. I want you to say it, not just as lip service, but if you could just think about it for a minute before you say it. I want you to tell him again, say, I trust you, Jesus. My trust 
is in you. Hallelujah. If my trust is in him, then that means that whatever I've been anxious about or whatever I've been worried about, I have to let go. Because either I trust him and I don't have to worry, or I'm leaning on the arm of flesh and I'm going back to my wilderness. But if I trust him, I say, thank you, Lord, you got me. You're going to take care of my health, Lord. I trust you. I don't know what to do about this kid that's having problems. Maybe you have a child that's having issues. Lord, I trust you with my kid. Maybe there's a financial issue. Lord, I thank you that you've got me. You're going to take care of me, Lord. I trust you with my finances. I trust you with my decision making. I'm by the river. The river's going to flow. It's going to bring me the resources. It's going to bring me the wisdom. It's going to bring me what I need. Heal me, God, and I'll be healed. Save me and I'll be saved. My trust is in you, Lord. <sighs> Heal me from the things that have broken trust in my life. That's what we're saying. Heal me from, from the curse of leaning upon man and putting too much trust in man. Thank you, God. I saw the damage that that did. It, 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 it did something to me and it affected me in my heart. It affected my emotions. It, it affected the, my perception. And, and I don't even know my own motives. I don't even know what I'm capable of. But you know what's going on in me and you know me better than I even know myself. Heal me, Lord. God is putting us into a new place. He's putting us, putting us into a new environment. He's created a new garden. It's a new garden called the church. It's a new garden called the church. Hallelujah. And I'm here and I'm trusting him. Let's clap our hands again to the Lord. Let's give him praise in Jesus' name. So this is what I want you to do. I want you to do. I want you to connect with at least one or two people close by you right now. Would you do that? Connect with them just for a second. We're going to pray one more prayer and then we'll release you. I want us to pray tonight that all the worry, all the worry will be exhaled. Can we do that tonight? Can we ask God to help us? Sometimes we need to have somebody else pray it for us, for us, and we can agree it for somebody else. Let's pray that all the worry, that we can just take the worry and we can exhale and just release it right now. Father, I am speaking to worry. I am speaking to anxiety. I am speaking to fear. And we are speaking in the name of Jesus for it to leave right now. In the name of Jesus. <laughs> we will not fear when the heat comes. We will not be anxious and concerned in the year of drought. This is your word to us tonight. We will not worry. We will not fear. We will not be anxious because we know what you've done in our lives. We know where you planted us. And we know that you're in charge. You're in control. <laughs> That's it. Just let the Holy Ghost work right now. Just let him flow right now. Thank you, Lord. Oh. When I don't worry, I can get healed. When I don't worry, He can save me. When I'm not worried about who's, who's watching or what anybody thinks about me, when I just say, my trust is in you, God. Oh, then a change comes. 
a change comes. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. He never sleeps and he never slumbers. <laughs> he will never leave me nor forsake me. God has taken you to a new place. You're not in the same wilderness. You're not in that same place that you've been in your whole life. You're in a new place. This is a safe place. This is a healing place. This is a place to be nourished. This is a place to put down your roots. This is a place where you can bear fruit. we're just praying with each other and encouraging each other right now we're bearing each other's burdens right now for a few minutes we're just saying I trust you Jesus I trust you Jesus something happens in our hearts something happens when we shift trust something happens in our hearts when we shift trust ah. hallelujah thank you Lord little bit of drought comes Satan tries to remind us of our wilderness where there wasn't any water but a little bit of drought is nothing for a tree that's got good root systems that's in a good environment I'm gonna tell you something right here right here you can be nourished right here you can be strengthened right here you can bear fruit right here God's going to tap the potential that's in you and he's going to bring it out right here. Right here. Thank you, Jesus. He is faithful and you can trust him. Amen. Clap our hands one more time to the Lord tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Such a rich flow of the Holy Ghost. Pray that you're blessed tonight. Go home filled Go home touched and strengthened. Greet somebody before you leave. Sunday's going to be a launch of a new series. Hey Amen. It's going to be a great day. Who got it? Matilda got the Holy Ghost. Oh, this is not.
Matilda's little sister? Okay. Matilda's big sister, okay. She got the Holy Ghost too? Oh, she is Matilda. Yeah, I thought that was Matilda. She got the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Hallelujah. I already told you, clap for the last time. And Joshua also got the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. You just got, you just got a new environment. <laughs> Get them roots down now. That's right. You found out the flow. You found the river. Hallelujah. How beautiful.